Hello, YouTubers and NFL fans everywhere. This is Matt, the NFL fanatic, giving you my Week 11 2022 NFL predictions. Well, for the fanatic last week, after the couple great weeks that I had, both against the spread and straight up, unfortunately, uh, the fanatic came back down to earth. He had a very tough week, both against the spread and straight up. Um, so so far, so so far this week. Against the spread, I am four and nine. Um, so after the few weeks of having positive records against the spread, this week I had a brutal record against the spread, going four and nine. Uh, and straight up, I didn't do that much better. I went five and eight. Uh, so that equals up to about thirty-one percent and thirty-eight and a half percent, respectively. And now we're all for the year against the spread. I am seventy, seventy-five and four against the spread, and straight up now I'm eighty-six, sixty-two and one. That equals up to forty-eight point three percent. Against the spread and straight up, that equals up to 58.1%. So, uh, definitely the uh, 500 streak. It's been good to keep it there, and, and I still have plenty of time to get above 500, but honestly, I don't know if how my luck's been. It's uh, very tough to see if I, will, if I will be able to hit the 500 mark. And the 60% straight up this year of how crazy the year's been, it's still in reach. Having last week did not help going 5-8, and eight. Um, but definitely a uh, step in the wrong direction. But it was a crazy week in the NFL, like they always are. Um, congrats to the game of the year, in my opinion. The Minnesota Vikings-Buffalo Bills game in Buffalo yesterday was, in fact, the game of the year. Crazy, insane game between two very good teams uh, that went back and forth. Um, Justin Jefferson had the catch of the year, and in my opinion, one of the greatest catches, if not the greatest catch I've ever physically seen, um, even over the Odo Beckham catch back in 2014 against Brandon Carr when the uh, Giants played the Cowboys. But that was a crazy catch, crazy sequence of a game. And I honestly thought Kirk Cousins blew the game like Kirk Cousins usually does in those spots. But I forgot it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So Kirk Cousins was able to uh, bounce back very well. And he was able to hit Justin Jefferson who had 190 plus yards, 10 receptions on 16 targets. What a job. What a game. Shout out to the Vikings. For seven of themselves in uh, one score games. They were eight, six and eight last year in those same games. Um, when you look at other big moments, Miami continues to roll. The Finns are rolling. Another one for Tua. Seven and zero as the starter. Um, Tua is now the first quarterback since Dan Marino back in '84. So I believe they have like three straight games of three TDs and no interceptions. He is leading the league in quarterback rating and ESPN QBR stat. Um, the Dol Dolphins defense for the first time in a while put up a very good game all around. Um, they got they got Nick Chubb the fumble, which I believe is you know that's a rarity for Nick Chubb to for that to happen. And I, I think the Dolphins, especially after the Bills losing, are the second best team in the AFC with to a quarterback. But I, I want to give a quick shout out to Miami, uh, New Orleans, and Pittsburgh. What a game that was! Uh, congratulations to Mr. T.J. Watt for making it back from his pectoral injury. And what does he do? Even with Minka Fitzpatrick, will be out a few weeks due to his appendicitis. Hopefully he will uh, get his appendectomy and get back by the end of the season. But what does he do in his return? The Saints, who had one of the hottest offenses in the, in the league for the past four or five weeks, they get held to the lowest amount of points, lowest amount of yards, and lowest amount of rushing yards in the game against Pittsburgh. And Kenny Pickett gets his first victory wire to wire as a starter. If everybody remembers, remember he got concussed in the Bucks game. The Trubisky ended up pulling that victory out, but uh, that is his first career win, wire to wire. So, congratulations to Pittsburgh there. Um, Bears Lions, what a game that was. Uh, the Bears, man, Justin Fields, what a fun talent he has been to watch. Uh, the first team in NFL history to have five straight games of 120 or 225 plus rushing yards or more. Justin Fields is the first has the most rushing yards for a quarterback in any five game stretch in NFL history. He's also thrown you know about nine touchdowns himself in that stretch as well. So he's doing it with his arm. I just think the problem is remember the Bears they traded Robert Quinn they traded Roquan Smith, and they are the first team in NFL history to have scored twenty nine points in three consecutive games twenty nine more more points in three consecutive games and they have lost all three games. And just for a fun fact, um, they have given up. 32, about 33 points a game since they uh, have traded those defensive assets. So, definitely in a way, it's nice to see Fields do well, but he's still losing. 
So, you know, Zach Wilson's winning games. And Mac Jones still winning games. So, Justin, you're going to need to, you know, switch that left side of the column up. I know it's great and people are, are wowed by the talent. But eventually that rushing and all that fun stuff, that's not going to last. And if you can't get wins, those are just empty numbers, my friend. But uh, kudos to the Bears there. And also kudos to the Lions. What a stretch for them. You know, the first time back-to-back wins since week six and seven of the 2020 season. Uh, they um, got their first road win in the last 13 tries. It's been, it's been almost over a year and a half since the Lions have been able to win a road game. That was Dan Campbell's first, Dan Campbell Jared Goff's first road win as a franchise. And they scored 21 points in the fourth quarter, and, you know, or in the second half to beat the Bears and the little go to the game, Cairo Santos, after that great 61-yard rush by Justin Fields. He missed the extra point, which ended up being the difference in the game. So, sucks to be him. Um, but that was Sterling, um, Cardinals, Rams, a couple of the losses I had, if anybody really would have thought that the Cardinals, Rams game was going to go from Matthew Stafford and Kyler Murray to John Wolford and Colt McCoy, if I would have known that from the beginning of the week or any point earlier in the week until Sunday afternoon, I would have taken probably Arizona just because if I knew the backups were in and Colt McCoy ended up playing a better game. He is now actually 3-0 as the Cardinals starter in his Cardinals tenure, so good for him. Um, that, that was a weird loss. Um, Colts Raiders, and I have plenty to say about that, you know, when I talk about the Raiders game, um, here in a bit, uh, but that was bizarre. Kudos to Jeff Saturday. He got a lot of flack, rightfully so for the most part, but he did get the victory against Josh McDaniels and the Raiders and Derek Carr and all that, but let me, let me do my thing. Uh, but that was a crazy, crazy loss and just so many, you know, so many others throughout the week. I didn't expect, you know, Carolina beating Atlanta to begin the week. Nobody really expected, especially the way Atlanta played. But, you know, that's the fun of the NFL. But, um, so, now let me get into my picks. Um, before I do that, though, the bias for this week, it is the Seattle Seahawks and the state of Florida. So, the Jaguars, Dolphins, and Buccaneers all have buys this week. So, you have Trevor Lawrence, Travis Etienne, uh, Christian Kirk, Zay Jones, uh, James, or... Uh, you have Tua, Tyreek, Jalen, Gusecki, the Dolphins defense, Geno, Kenneth Walker, DK, Tyler, Will Disley, Jason Myers, Jason Sanders, Brady, Godwin, Evans, the Bucks defense, suck up. If you have any of those players on your fantasy teams, bench them. They will not be playing this week. Once again, the Jag, the Seattle Seahawks, and the state of Florida all have buys this week. So if you have any of those players on your fantasy teams, bench them because they will not be playing this weekend. All right, it's time for my picks for... For this week, so on Thursday, when the six and three Tennessee Titans travel to Green Bay to take on the four and six Green Bay Packers, the Green Bay Packers are two and a half point favorites in this game. Give me the Green Bay Packers here, minus two and a half, and the Green Bay Packers straight up. Then the next game, when the three and seven Chicago Bears travel to Atlanta to take on the four and six Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons are three-point favorites in this game. In my in one of my two outright upsets this week, give me the Chicago Bears here, plus three, and the Chicago Bears straight up. Then the next game, when the three and six Cleveland Browns travel to Buffalo, take only six and three Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills are nine-point favorites in this game. Give me Buffalo here at minus nine, and Buffalo straight up. Then the next game, when the eight or when the 9-0 or 8-1 Philadelphia Eagles travel to Indianapolis to take on the 4-5-1 Indianapolis Colts. The uh, Philadelphia Eagles are 9.5 point favorites in this game. Give me Philadelphia here, minus 9.5, and, and Philadelphia straight up. Then the next game, when the 6-3 and three New York Jets travel to New England to take on the 5-4 New England Patriots. The New England Patriots are 3.5 point favorites in this game. Give me the New England Patriots here, minus 3.5, and, and the New England Patriots straight up. Then the next game, when the 3-6 and six Los Angeles Rams travel to New Orleans to take on the 3-6 and six New Orleans Saints, or 3-7 or, uh, New Orleans Saints, the New Orleans Saints are three-point favorites in this game. Give me the New Orleans Saints here to win straight up, but I'm going to take the Los Angeles Rams, plus three. Uh, then the next game, when the 3-6 and six Detroit Lions travel to New York to take on the 7-2 and two New York Giants, the New York Giants are three-and-a-half-point favorites in this game. Give me the New York Giants here, minus three and a half, and the New York Giants, straight up. Then the next game, when the three and seven Carolina Panthers travel to Baltimore to take on the six and three Baltimore Ravens. 
the Baltimore Ravens are 12 and a half point favorites in this game. Uh, that is a crazy number. So give me the Baltimore Ravens here to win straight up, but I'm going to take Carolina plus 12 and a half. Then the next game, when the five and five or four and six Washington Commanders travel to Houston to take on the one six and one Houston Texans, the Washington Commanders are two and a half point favorites in this game. I like Washington here minus two and a half, and Washington straight up. Then the next game, when the three and six Las Vegas Raiders, sorry, or, 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 sorry when the two and seven Las Vegas Raiders travel to Denver to take on the three and six Denver Broncos in a very cruddy. AFC West Divisional Matchup. The Denver Broncos are three-point favorites in this game. In my second of three, I just realized what my picks. In the second of my three pure outright upset picks, give me the Las Vegas Raiders here, plus three, and the Las Vegas Raiders straight up. Then the next game, when the 6-3 and three Dallas Cowboys travel to Minnesota, take on the 8-1 Minnesota Vikings. The Dallas Cowboys, amazingly, after the performance they had against the Packers, are two-point favorites in this game. Uh, so in my third and final pure upset of the week, give me the Minnesota Vikings here, Plus two, and the Minnesota Vikings straight up. Then the next game, when the 5-4 and four Cincinnati Bengals travel to Pittsburgh to take on the 3-6 and six Pittsburgh Steelers. The uh, Cincinnati Bengals are five-point favorites in this game. Give me Cincinnati here, minus five, and Cincinnati straight up. Then in the Sunday night game, they got flexed due to the Bengals-Steeler game, not meaning as much when the 7-2 and two Kansas City Chiefs travel to Los Angeles to take on the 5-4 and four Los Angeles Chargers. The Los Angeles Chargers are seven-point underdogs in this game. Give me the Kansas City Chiefs here straight up, but I'm going to take the Los Angeles Chargers plus seven. Then in, in the Monday night game in Mexico City, when the five and four San Francisco 49ers travel to Arizona, to take on the four and six Arizona Cardinals. The San Francisco 49ers are seven and a half point favorites in this game. Give me San Francisco here minus seven and a half, and San Francisco straight up. All right, it's time for my thoughts on each game. The Green Bay Packers over the Tennessee Titans, this is one to where, look, the Titans, they they got another gritty, ugly victory. Derrick Henry only had 53 yards on the ground. That Denver defense did an incredible job there. And the only receiver that made a big impact uh, was uh, Nick Westbrook Akina, or Akini, either way, you know, Akina, Akina, Akini, my apologies to him, uh, if I pronounce his name, his last name correctly, or incorrectly. He had 119 yards and two touchdowns, including a big 70-plus yard touchdown that was coming off a flea putter. So, very nicely done there. Um, and, look, this Titans team, they are 6-3, and three and but it's not pretty. In their six wins, they have won their six games by 36 points. So, if you do the math, that is six points per win. And, you know, look, the Titans, they've had a lot of injuries. They just I just read that Caleb Farley has a disc injury, and he's had a you know long history of back and neck problems, so I hope he's okay. But if that's not looking good, Bud Dupree was out. They have other... Je- Jeffrey Simmons was out. They had, they had a lot of big defensive injuries. And the Titans receiving core really is not that great outside of Traylon Burks, who could have potential. And maybe Akina, maybe Bobby Trees, Robert Woods, occasionally. Uh, but, you know, they do have a solid way of playing games. And honestly, I thought after... Depending on how the Packers game looked, I didn't think the Packers... We're going to, you know, win that game against Dallas. But after watching them play and after seeing Christian Watson uh, become the first Packers rookie wide receiver to have three uh, touchdowns uh, in a game, uh, first time since 1978, and the Packers ran for 207 yards on the ground um, combined from Aaron Jones, A.J. Dillon, and, you know, Aaron Rodgers himself, I was really impressed with how the Packers were able to use the run game uh, to get play action. Rodgers looked more comfortable. Rodgers made a lot more accurate throws. And it just comes down to the Titans in this spot. Uh, The Titans have a losing record of primetime games under Mike Vrabel. I think he's one game under 500 in these primetime spots. Uh, The last time the Titans played Green Bay in Green Bay, they got demolished. Um, I don't think it's going to be that bad because I think these two teams are very different. But I just have to trust that the Packers in this this type of big spot, knowing that they have the win, knowing that their playoff hopes we're, are barely kept afloat now with that one over Dallas, playing a Titan team that is six and three but doesn't play like it, and just kind of realizing where the Packers are. I'm going to trust that the uh, Packers roster uh, does enough to where they you know they win this game with another strong running game. I think the Packers secondary is going to make it very hard for Tannehill to make a lot of big throws outside. There's going to be a lot of Robert Tunyon who was really held uh, in check a lot uh, yesterday. 
So yeah, but in this game, I'm going to take the better quarterback, the more confident win, and I just I, I think with the Titans, it's one of those things where I think Rodgers overtakes Tannehill in these spots, and if they kind of can build off that momentum, and Derrick Henry doesn't run him into the ground, which I don't think he will, I think the Packers win this game. In a very interesting game. Wouldn't be surprised Tennessee won, but I think with the injuries, the short week, and just the lack of inconsistency I saw in Tennessee going against this type of Packer opponent, giving the Packers the win. Uh, so that's why Green Bay here minus 2.5, and, and Green Bay straight up. The next game, the Chicago Bears over the Atlanta Falcons. Uh, this is one to where I am taking the Chicago Bears uh, basically based off the better quarterback. Um, you know, both these teams are not, you know, great. They're both kind of like, I think, you know, the Falcons you can see is overachieving. The Bears are the underachieving fun watch, <laughs> if you will. I, you know, again, I am not... You know, I'm kind of getting tired of this Justin Fields statistic hoopla of his running. Again, he looks like just, uh, he looks like Lamar back in his rookie year. And again, that's great if you keep running, but you can't, you know, you got to find a way to win games. Jared Goff outplayed Justin Fields at the very end. J Justin Fields, for as mobile as he was, got sacked back-to-back -back times in a spot to where, you know, he blew them the game. You know, so, but the reason why I'm taking the Bears is it's, it's just because of how awkward the Falcons have looked as a team. Like, that game against Carolina, they should not have been down by 10. And, look, they gave up 232 rush yards. Uh, they gave, like, 130 to De Deontay Foreman. LaVisca Chanel had a 42-yard rush. Um, and Kyle Pitts and Drake London, their two best you know, first-round pick receivers at tight end and wide receiver, respectively, combined had seven receptions for only 66 yards against the Panthers, on the road. Mariota played okay, and I do want to say the Falcons' secondary really let him down by dropping not one, not two, but three potential picks. Um, and it's one of those things to where I just feel like, again, like I've seen enough out of fields that if with, with this Bears team that's ran, like I said before, for five straight games or 225 rushing yards, that it goes right against the biggest weakness of the Falcons defense over the last couple games, which has been their rush defense. Um, and I just think, again, Fields, I think, will make a few more plays than Mariota. Um, it's one of those interesting things to where, like, you know, if the Falcons defense can get a couple stops or, you know, Mariota can make a few more throws, I think the Falcons could win. But in this type of game, from what you've seen over the last few weeks, I'm going to take the Bears quarterback, who's been much more consistent uh, than the Falcons won, even though I know the Falcons have a better defense. Also, it just it was a, a crying shame as well, and I'm not being fantasy biased here, even though I do have Cordell Patterson on my fantasy team. Cordell Patterson, after having that great game uh, against the Chargers two weeks ago, he only ran for like 20 yards against the Panthers defense, which did not help things at all. So, uh, so that's why I like uh, Chicago here. Plus three, and Chicago straight up. The next game, the Buffalo Bills over the Cleveland Browns. Um, this is one to wear look. The Cleveland Browns are not a very good football team. Uh, Nick Chubb for the day was held to 66 yards. And he had a big fumble that could have changed the momentum of the game. Uh, Jacoby had only had 212 yards passing. But 131 of those went to uh, Amari Cooper and people, Donovan Peoples-Jones. I think Amari Cooper had three catches for 33 yards. And Peoples-Jones had about 99 uh, for the rest of the way. Um, or 98 yards the rest of the way. Including you know a couple big bombs early in the game. But this Browns team is not very good. That defense of all the talent they had, and they had Denzel Ward back, they had Clowney, they had Garrett. They scored on every drive except one when they failed on a fourth down. They could have kicked a field goal, but they decided to let Jeff Wilson run it up the middle and stupidly, you know, didn't take the points. But, yeah, that, uh, that, that Browns team is not very good. I know Deshaun coming back will help a lot of things. Okay, and I, I do think the Browns have a chance of winning out the rest of the way through with Deshaun there. You know, even though, you know, they do have some tough games, even in that stretch. But I, I think the Browns are going to be down so much that it's not going to matter. Um, and it's just one of those things to where, look, the Bills, as great as they have been, I, I think, and even for me as a Josh Allen fan, I think Bills fans have to start realizing that they put too much in that $42 million six-year extension with Josh Allen. Because, hard to believe it, folks, but it's true. Josh Allen is has... has led the league this year so far through 10 weeks with 10 interceptions. Even Matt Ryan, who got benched, has less interceptions. Davis Mills has fewer interceptions than Josh Allen does. And another big problem is 
the Bills have no rushing game outside of Josh Allen. The Bills running backs. I think Josh Allen had like 80 yards or you know another 80 yards. All the other running backs that the Bills had, even I, I, even though I know Singletary scored two touchdowns himself. The Bills running backs had 12 fewer yards than Josh Allen did rushing. And that running attack has been an absolute abject disaster. You know, outside of Josh Allen. And that's adding James Cook. That's having Zach Moss for me. That's having Devin Singletary. That's having Nakeem Hines. And people think that, you know, they can draft another running back. Like, this Bills running back team is not good at all. And when you have to rely so much on Josh Allen, who feels like, you know, at moments where, you know, he has to keep throwing and throwing or making these stupidly risky throws where it's like Farvest to where, like, he's chucking balls to where, like, he doesn't have to. He chucked the ball to Patrick Peterson on fourth and two, actually both interceptions, to where he didn't need to do that. McDermott should have just taken the points. And then the other time, you know, it's second and ten at the Minnesota 20. He didn't need to go for it all at that spot. Um, It just, it really cost him the game. And I think it, right now he's not the MVP. Anybody that has Josh Allen in the MVP conversation, now moving on, full stop, stop. He's not winning the award. And that include you know, and I have to stop saying that. And I even had him winning the award originally before the year began. And also, the other problem is the Bills in the last two years have been in 11 one-score games. Over the last two years, the Bills are now 2-9 and nine in one-score games. They are a great knockout artist. They will take that right hand, and that will punch you out really quickly if they can get on you within, you know, they get a 10 to 14-point lead. They'll pour it on the rest of the way through. But if you hang around, or Josh Allen lets you hang around the game long enough, the Bills are showing you they probably are not going to win those close games. And uh, that is a problem. I do think, though, with this Bills team, the way Miami play, I, I think Buffalo could play a similar type game. Maybe not just with the running. But I just think with the Bills, that with the Browns kind of injuries, the hopefully the secondary gets back with maybe Tredavious White this week or sooner or later. Uh, Poyer's still out of an arm injury. Like, if that secondary gets better and more well-rounded, I think the Bills get a nice, comfortable victory. It'll help the Bills against them seven wins. It helps them go back into the playoff spot. But now you're looking at Miami going, okay, all Miami has to do is, you know, Buffalo still has to play Cincinnati still. And Miami, you know, they have a tough game against San Francisco. But it's like there's a game, there's a sense in, there's a sense in Miami that they actually have a legitimate chance to win this division uh, due to the Bills and FCU over the last couple weeks. So, I think if Cleveland's able to run the ball really effectively, I think, you know, that that could be a difference. And Dalvin Cook did have an 88-yard touchdown run. So it is possible you can run on the Bills. But I just think with the how the Bills usually are in this kind of angry environment, I think they get this victory in a tough, hard-fought game against the Browns team that's not going to be that motivated, especially with Tampa coming up the week after. You know, they're going to try to get to the Sean point. And I think it's going to be too late, but I just can't see the Bills losing three straight games without the way he's been playing the last couple of weeks. Or with, with how good this team is against the Browns. So we'll see about that. So that's why I like Buffalo here, minus nine, and Buffalo straight up. The next game, the Philadelphia Eagles over the Indianapolis Colts. Um, this is one to where, <laughs> look, um, Philadelphia is the best team in the NFL. Anybody that, that disagrees with that is just either being a big hater of the Eagles or, you know, they just don't really watch the game. They don't really look at the context of record or the simple things of football, you know. And I know Philadelphia, you know, they play, they're they not playing tonight, but they lead the league in turnover differential. Best start in franchise history. They're not showing any second half. Um, and, you know, they just have a lot more better talent. Um, and they're, they're going to be the Colts team that, again, have been up, up and down. But to be fair, Matt Ryan in five starts, he does have uh, four He does have four game-winning drives or something like where he's like he started five games and, like, he has four game-winning drives, four fourth-quarter comebacks. And, you know, he's thrown for a good amount of yards as well in those games. Also, I want to congratulate Matt Ryan. He had the longest rush of his career. An insane 39-yard run, which basically gave them a huge boost going into the, you know, forward end there. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things to where, you know, and Jonathan Taylor. He had his first 100-yard rushing day since week one. He had 163 yards, played really well. They would have controlled the game. Paris Campbell with a big 35-yard touchdown, which made the difference. And Stephon Gilmore with the defensive play of the game on Devontae Adams. And, you know, 
for Mr. Jeff Saturday on his first Sunday, he got a victory. And now Jeff Saturday has won more close games than the Las Vegas Raiders have. And Jeff Saturday proved that he is better than Josh McDaniels. Which is saying a lot, but I'll get to that in a second. But this is a completely different team. This is Nick Sirianni getting to play uh, his, you know, his former organization. You know, I know it's Jeff and it's different staff. But most of that staff is still there. So they definitely know some tendencies that they could look from the beginning and look what, you know, Reggie, uh, this new offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator from Gus, they, 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 they know. He knows who they are. You know, he knows how effective they can be just from his, you know, previous experiences in – Indianapolis, and I think, look, Jeff's going to have a nice moment, he's going to have a nice few days uh, through next week, but I think next week when they play the Eagles, and the Eagles hand them a very nice, comfortable loss, I think the Jeff Saturday shine goes down a bit, and the Eagles get to a very comfortable 10-0, and with only seven games left before a perfect season is attained, so, and they play the Packers next weekend, so, so, we'll see about that, but that's why I like Philadelphia here, minus nine and a half, Philadelphia straight up, the next game, the... New England Patriots over the New York Jets. Uh, this is the one... This is a game to where... They just played this game two weeks ago. They just played this game two weeks ago. And I know, look, a lot a lot of things, you know, happened over the last couple weeks. The Patriots played the Colts and dominated them. And the Jets got a big upset victory over the Bills. So, you know, those kind of things really do kind of help shift the momentum. I do want to highlight a lot of the positives from the Jets' defense. Uh, so right now, so far this year... Through all the games, they are 10th in points per game. They are 7th in opponent yards per game. They are... They have the second best fourth down conversion defense. They have allowed the 8th uh, fewest touchdowns per game at 2.1. Uh, also, I'm going to graduate, you know, Sauce Gardner, who's going to be, in my opinion, the defensive rookie of the year. I think only Tariq Wo- uh, Wooten from Seattle has any kind of chance. He has the most passes defended, and his passer rating when... Uh, guarded against him is a very respectable or very good 71.7 when you look at the uh, you know Pats Jets game here look the Pats are coming off a game where they played Sam Ellinger and Frank Reich's final game that they had the second most sacks in Patriots franchise history with nine Uh, Matthew Judon and Josh Uche both had three each and actually Matt Judon is in line for the Deacon Jones award he is actually leading the league in, in the NFL in sacks at about 11 and a half. And fun fact, by the way, um, Matt Judon for leading the league in sacks is only the 25th highest paid pass rusher. So that is a great bargain. And the Colts, you know, two games ago where they were 7 for 11 against uh, the Raiders yesterday, or 6 of 11 for the Colts yesterday, they were over 14 on third down against the Pats two weeks ago. So that was a pretty impressive uh, feat there. And Mac Jones had his first game without an interception. He didn't need to do a lot due to uh, Ellinger throwing a pick six and having a couple of interceptions. But this is just one of those games to where, again, like, I've seen the Jets play. And look, you know, the wounds fresh in their mind, and that can be a good or bad thing, and they've, they've had a bye. But I, if I remember correctly, I think the Jets were on a bye last year playing this Patriot team, and they got shut out like 59 to like, or they got beat up 59 to 14. Do I think the Jets are going to look that bad this weekend? Absolutely not. I do not think that is going to happen. However... I just think with that recent string of history, with how bad Zach Wilson's played against this team, with how the Pats are getting some weapons back, maybe they'll get Devontae Parker back, and they're being at home, I just have to take the Patriots in this game once again um, to show that the Patriots still continue to psychologically and physically own the New York Jets franchise in these moments. And this is a, this would be a big win for the Patriots. It gets them to 6-4, and four, and it gets them... Uh, to have the overall head-to-head tiebreaker over the Jets, which definitely with how close the wall card races, that could literally determine if the Patriots get in the playoffs or they do not. Right now, the Patriots are the seventh seed as of now. So, amazingly, the AFC East, the entire AFC East, could get into the playoffs today if the season ended. If anybody had that on their football bingo cards, good for you. You are a diehard AFC East fan. I didn't think that, but... um, And, you know... The Pat, you know, again, could the Jets win this game? Sure, they could. I think they could. Um, because, again, I think the Jets, they have confidence. They're coming off the high of the Bills game, but I think at the same time, with that high having to go on the road now to New England uh, from the last time they played them and just kind of like Belichick's confidence against the bye, knowing where the, the uh, Jets are situated, I think the Pats win this game one more time. 
Maybe next year Zach Wilson can get better or some more talent. Maybe they finally can beat the Patriots, but I just don't think it'll be this this week. So we'll see. So that's why I like New England here, minus three and a half, and New England straight up. The next game. Um the Los Angeles or the New Orleans Saints over the Los Angeles Rams. Uh this is a game to where when you look at the uh LA Rams, my god. Is that team an abject disaster? I mean, they have the worst running attack in the NFL. They, their, their yardage is pretty good. You know, they're sixth in the league in yards per game defensively. But they're the 18th defensive points per game. And the biggest reason why for that is they've given up the fourth most turnovers offensively. Stafford had like eight interceptions and Wolford had an interception the other day. And only for the third time in Sean McVay's career, he's on a three-game losing streak. And he's never been... Three games under 500 at this point. Um, which they are at three and six. You know, I think when you look at the uh, Saints here, look, like I said before, the Saints were held defensively to their lowest amount of total yards and rushing yards. And also, here's a key fact as well. If the Saints try to win any games, if they do not get a turnover defensively, they are 0-4 in the game. So for the Rams to win this game, they just do not have to turn it over. Um, and if, if you're the Saints, you're really disappointed. The Saints had six sacks on Kenny Pickett, and the Steelers only had two, but they only could put up ten points. And the other reason why I'm going with the Saints is even if Stafford plays, okay, and I, I will bring this up just like I said last week, if Matthew Stafford is out, I, um, regardless of Matthew Stafford's availability this weekend, I'm taking the one Saints to win. However, if, this, if Stafford is out, I will switch my against the spread pick from L.A. Rams plus three to New Orleans, Minus three or the updated odds to whatever that game is it, once that news comes out. Um, but I just think, you know, when you had Cooper Cup, who was dealing with an ankle injury already, who was playing through it the week before, um, he suffered another ankle injury, which was probably an aggravation of the current one he was at. He will be out for some time, according to Sean McVay. And if he is out with that, you know, bad offensive line, even with Stafford or Wolford back there, I just can't see the Saints defense not having a field day in New Orleans. Uh, against that Rams offensive line and Rams general offense. <laughs> um, I think to me, you know, when you look at this Rams Saints game, this is a really sad game. I think it would be more of a sadder game for the, the Rams to lose because the Rams are making the playoffs, and this Rams team went from being the cream of the crop in February to now we're going into mid November this year, and boy, how the mighty have fallen. That is a just very sad moment there. Um, but yeah, I just think with that Saints defense and that Saints, um, offense enough. I think that Saints defense can shut down the Rams offense enough where I don't think Stafford or Wolford are going to have enough time. They're not going to be able to run the ball. And I think Dalton with his weapons can make a few throws or timely decisions with Kamara with some of the talent they have to win this game. Would I be surprised if the Rams won this game? Not at all. Especially with Stafford playing. That I just think of how the Bucks game ended up. I think the Saints game would be a very similar situation. Just the difference I'm banking on Andy Dalton instead of Tom Brady. And if I get that game wrong, that was, that was the problem. I wanted to I bet on any goal. So, that's why I like the New Orleans Saints here to win straight up. The Los Angeles Rams plus three. The next game, the New York Giants over the Detroit Lions. This is one to where, um, to me, uh, you know, look, I'm happy for the Lions. And if anybody that's watched these videos, knows, I am a Dan Campbell fan. I've rooted for the guy. And it's very weird for me because Dan Campbell, usually I'm not a big rah-rah guy. But I love Dan Campbell's spirit. I love his attitude. And I'm so happy for the Lions that they won back-to-back -back games. And they were able to get the, the road division streak, the road loss off their back. It was great. But they're playing, instead of the Bears, which kind of were comparable rosters and no defense, you're playing the New York Giants, who have been one of the most consistent stories in the entire league. Um, Saquon Barkley, congratulations to him against Houston. He had a career high in carries with, um, I think, 35 for about a buck 36, and he had another touchdown. Daniel Jones threw two touchdowns, one to Darius Slayton, and the other one to tight end Lawrence Cager, who scored his first career touchdown. Um, and it's just one of those things, again, to where, like, the Giants, they don't wow you. They don't. But they, I, what I love about the Giants is every single week they play solid, consistent, turnover-free, mostly fundamental football. If you if you can get mistakes put on you, 
that will, you know, that's the worst thing because the Giants are going to make mistakes and are going to make you, the opponent, forced into mistakes. And, you know, look, I, I think with the Giants, uh, with the rest of their schedule, it does get tougher. They do have the Cowboys coming up with Thanksgiving. They have two games against the Eagles still, but they also have two games against the Commanders. So I do believe the Giants, if or when they win this game, they will make the playoffs with a record no worse than 10-7. and 7. Um, And it's just one of those things, again, that we're like, I'm, I'm sorry, Lions, you know, it's been one of those weird things to where, like, if your opponents, you play Buffalo on Thanksgiving in your annual game. So, you, I'm just spoiling. Shout out to Happens, but sorry, buddy. Uh, I just, I can't go with the Lions just yet. But if the Lions do win that game against the Giants, I think you have to give Dan Campbell some credit. And even if he can't get to, let's say, eight wins, if he gets to six or seven, then maybe, you know, then maybe you consider keeping him. I wouldn't, again, I, I think he would need to get eight wins, but if he can beat... The New York Giants, which would be a big win, that would give back-to-back road wins for Campbell, and it could give you know his job and, and that team some hope moving you know forward in the next year. But I just think with the Giants, this is just one of those games to where the Giants are just clearly to me the uh, better organization. They've been more consistent. They have the better running game. They're going up against a weaker defense, and I just think with the Lions, with the injuries of Saint Rob Brown or Amon Ross Saint Brown, uh, Swift's been banged up. And I just think the Giants' defense, they're not going to give up 21 points or three scores in the fourth quarter in the second half to lose a game like that. So that's why I like the uh, New York Giants here, minus three and a half, and New York Giants straight up. Let's see, next game, next game. Next game. The Baltimore Ravens over the Carolina Panthers. Uh, this is one to where, look, um, I want to give some credit to Deontay Foreman, who over the last few weeks... Um, three of the last four games, he has rushed for 122 yards per game in three of the last four games. If you take out the Bengal game where they were just wiped out quickly, 35 to nothing by the end of the half, um, he's averaged 122 yards in, in three of the last four games, and the Panthers won two of the three games. And I'm going to give the Panthers defensive credit for a unit that didn't have a lot of great moments of pressure against the Falcons on Thursday night. They did get five sacks as a unit, which I thought was a big key factor in how they were able to maintain and hold on to win that game. Um, but I do feel like for the for the Panthers, they did have a, another kind of moment to where, once again, another, so all three of the Panthers starting quarterback, fun little factor, they all have suffered ankle injuries this year. Uh, two of them, Baker and now P.J. Walker, has suffered a high ankle sprain himself. So now Baker Mayfield is the starter, and Sam Darnold becomes the backup, who was coming off an ankle injury himself. Um, and look, to me, like this is one of those easy games where, like, look, the Ravens, as much as the injuries have affected them on the offensive side of the ball, from the running back to the offensive line to the receivers to, the, you know, Mark Andrews himself, uh, the Ravens are the first team since the 2011 Packers who have, in the first nine games, uh, double-digit leads in every single game. Unfortunately, we are 6-3 and three in that span. Every other team that had that kind of mark, at least, went, I think, 8-1 eight, eight and one or 9-0 and oh at that point with double-digit leads. Um, also, when you look at the Ravens' victories, one of the key stats, which maybe isn't surprising is the rushing in five in the last five wins for the ravens the ravens at least have rushed for 155 plus yards as a team unit combined in their last five wins so definitely this is a game to where running the ball is going to be paramount and consistent and lamar jackson in his very you know short or in his tenure with the ravens every four games he gets to play against the nfc he does a really good job in 17 starts against the nfc Throughout his career, he has 25 touchdowns and six interceptions with a 14 and three record. Um, I am going to take the Panthers here plus 12 and a half just because of maybe how good Foreman's been, and I, I think Baker can give you some better throwing aspects. Um, but I, I, th I think at the end of the day, I think the Ravens are just too consistent. We've kind of gained some confidence. We're trying to get a four-game win streak going here and maintain our division lead in the AFC North. And I just think with the Ravens, I trust what the, the Ravens offense and team is going to do in these spots. So, again, 12 and a half is a lot of points. And maybe, you know, Cincinnati, you know, maybe pull Cincinnati. We blow them out early. We hold on. But I think with the Ravens, I'm just not as sold as much. And I do think Baker, with his history against the Ravens, that'll all be great. But Baker has definitely had some moments against the Ravens to where he will definitely keep the Panthers hanging around much longer than maybe the average fan expects. So, I'll take the Ravens here to win straight up. This is one of my, you know, locks of the week, in my opinion, in terms of picking but in terms of against the spread, I can't take that 12.5 point spread, realizing how good the Panthers have been on the ground lately in two of the last three games. So, 
That's why I like the Baltimore Ravens here. Uh, the win straight up will give me the Carolina Panthers, plus 12 and a half. The next game, the Washington Commanders over the Houston Texans. Uh, this is one to where the Texans are the worst team in the league. Um, you know, Washington, Houston has a bottom 10 offense and a bottom 10 defense. Damian Pierce, for even though he had 93 yards rushing, he had his first career fumble loss in the game against the Giants yesterday. Um, and I just think, again, Washington, and when you just watch Houston, I still can't believe Jacksonville lost to them in the way they did. Um, but that's the, you know, failed prince that was promised. Um, but it's just one of those things to where I just think Washington is just a better team. They should, get, they should be getting Chase Young back maybe by next week. He's out tonight against the Eagles, but they get him back. I, I just, I trust that Washington offense will do enough if it's Heineke or Wentz. And I just want to highlight one of the biggest problems I've had with Washington. So they have three tight ends on their roster through nine or yeah through nine games entering today. The Washington tight ends as a unit have 213 yards combined and only one touchdown. <laughs> which is amazing because you have Terry McLaurin. I know Jahan Dotson was out and he should be back tonight, which would be big uh, for them. But you have all that talent. But you have those three tight ends, including Logan Thomas, who you just gave an extension to. And those three guys, and I know I guess Thomas was coming off an ACL, so I understand that. Um, <laughs> um, they, they should not be that inept offensively to where, like, you basically have McLaurin and Dotson, and it's, there's nobody else. And that's what Heineke year wins. Um, but yeah, I just think when you look at Washington, they've just been clearly the more consistent team. Heineke year wins are better than Mills at this point, and the Texans just don't have a lot working up for them. And Brandon Cooks is disgruntled, and I think the Washington defense can do enough to hold him. And I just think Washington wins the game fairly easily. So, that's why I like uh, Washington here. Minus two and a half. And Washington straight up. The next game. The Las Vegas Raiders over the Denver Broncos. Okay. So, let me tell everybody real quickly. That was the worst loss I have ever seen a head coach have. Josh McDaniels, the absolute fraud of a human being, a waste of a space life form as a human being, had the lowest of lows I have ever seen a coach have. And I have no sympathy for that man. Actually, I, I'm personally happy about it. That guy is an absolute bum. He's a jerk. He's a prick. He's every bad thing you can think of. Okay? And first of all, again, he the Raiders were 7-2 and two in one-score games all last year, which was a big reason why they made the playoffs. This year, the McDaniels-led clowns are 0-6. You know... The, the Raiders, and I, I know, look, and I know Hunter Renfro's on the IR and Darren Waller's on the IR. And by the way, Darren Waller's not going to be on the team next year. Um, but besides Devontae Adams and Matt Collins, they have Keelan Cole and DJ Turner, okay? And Keelan Cole's had a couple plays, but those guys are basically non-existent in the offense. And Derek Carr and his crocodile tears. <laughs> you know, I bleed so much, but man, I, we, put, we put all this stuff in. And, you know, I was like, oh, my God, Derek, you lost to Indianapolis. You know, cry me a flippin' river, buddy. You suck. You haven't been great. You're going to get cut by February 12th to 15th. Stop being that emotional about it. You're, you've been bad the whole year. Why didn't you start crying after, uh, you know, week two when, you know, you lost 70-point lead then? Or week four when you had a 70-point lead? Why didn't you start crying then? What made it against Jeff Saturday, the former center? What made it so bad that you started breaking, you know, the Hoover Dam of tears started coming? Yeah, you know, give me a break with that crocodile tear stuff, man. Like, you're you're not you're, you're not helping things, you know. So, but that but that that loss just showed, showed everybody that Josh McDaniels is an absolute fraud, an absolute waste of space, a human coaching feces that he is. And to me, you know, I just think again he deserves all the criticism. And if I was Mark Davis, I would have fired that man. Once he got back to the locker room after losing to Jeff Saturday. But he's not going to get fired. And it's probably going to be Derek Carr gets cut between February 13th to the 15th. But with all that bad thing said. I am going to take the Raiders. Because I just, I can't trust Denver. And, and this hurts me more. Because I, you know, you guys know. Or if you watch my videos. I am a massive Russell Wilson fan. But he is by far having the worst year of his entire career. And he is playing worse than Derek Carr is. I will not, you know, out of all the quarterbacks that got big extensions, he looks the absolute worst, by far. 
Um, the Broncos through 10 weeks, okay, defensively, have given up 11 offensive touchdowns. That's it. That defense has been lights out. They've only given up 11 offensive touchdowns in 10 weeks. In 10 weeks. In 9 games, they've given up only 11 offensive touchdowns the whole year. And they st- and they are 3-6. and six. Their first four drives, they gained 92 total yards. And then they had a touchdown to uh, Jeff Virgil, the rookie, on the big play. Then they got a field goal. And then the six final drives, they had six plays per drive that only allowed 106 yards. I mean, that is just absolutely abysmal. It's sad. But that's just how inept Russell Wilson and that offense has been. I have no, none of their defensive guys and uh, the defensive coordinator for the Broncos who has that uh, African-sounding name that I can't really pronounce correctly. I don't want to botch that name. But that man and his unit have done God's work. They have done God's work for the Broncos all year. And the fact that they are 3-6 and six with only 11 offensive TDs given up in 10 weeks is just downright pathetic. And I, I blame primarily Hackett, Russell, and that offensive line as a unit for all that. And, Jer- and, and the receivers a bit, especially like Jerry Judy, hurt his ankle and he's probably going to be out for a while. And that's the problem. It's like the Raiders defense, they've given up 23 or more points every week. But who had 23 points scored? It was Denver, which was their highest total of the year. So it's like, you know, at the end of the day, as as bad as the Raiders have been, and as bad as the Broncos have been, and as much as I want to root for Russ, I just can't pick him because it's just like, at the end of the day, I, I'm just going to trust the Raiders' offense, and maybe Derek Carr's crocodile, snowflakey tears, you know, motivates the team, and maybe gets Josh McDaniels off the hook for a week. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, again, I, I, just, I, I have to trust the Raiders. And they beat them last time. Like, if the Broncos would have beat the Raiders in Las Vegas, I might have... I probably would have taken the Broncos. And I know Waller and Renfro are out, so that could probably get the Broncos a huge defensive edge. Um, but I just can't do it, man. I just think Devontae will have a big day, and I just can't trust the Raiders. I, I just can't trust the Broncos' offense enough that they'll be able to score enough and hold the Raiders to a low enough amount. So, yeah. And like, like I said, Derek Carr, world's smallest violin, crocodile tears. Give, give me a break with that crying stuff. You could... You should have cried after the 17th point, not losing to Jeff Saturday. You know, but... Also, he kind of divided the locker room, if you heard him. He said about some of the guys. So, which guys are not motivated? I'd love to know, but we'll never know. Um, all right, but that's why I like Las Vegas here, plus three in Las Vegas straight up. Again, if you take Denver, if you pick Denver, totally get it. And I'm probably making a bad pick, but I just, I can't trust Denver's offense. If Denver's offense does enough, good for them, but... Yeah. That's why I like Las Vegas here, plus three in Las Vegas straight up. The next game, the Minnesota Vikings over the Dallas Cowboys. Wow. Um, boy, was that a, uh, you know, weird dichotomy for both the Cowboys and the Vikings in their games. The Cowboys had a 14-point lead entering the fourth quarter, and they were 180-0 in regular and postseason games when they had that 14-point lead. That was the first time they lost to it um, from the Packers yesterday. Uh, Dak Prescott has the lowest quarterback rating in the third and fourth quarter this year, and over the last 10 years, and I, you know, I found this stat out, and this is a genuine stat, only over the last, or over the last uh, 11 years, only Tim Tebow this year has a worse passer rating on third and fourth down than Rain Dakota Prescott does. And also, you know, just to put Aaron, you know, just to put Dak's ineptitude in perspective, I found this stat on GetUp, um, you know, so shout out to Dan Orlovsky and to Hembo, um, the, their statistician. So apparently Dak Prescott, if you take Josh Allen, Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and Patrick Mahomes, in 10 games that he's played against those you know, top quarterbacks, and Allen, you could argue debatable right now, uh, he is 1-9 all time in, in those games against those top quarterbacks. So, you know, that's, again, that's the problem of paying top quarterback money to mediocre people. Um, and again, like when you look at the Cowboys, uh, the, de- the defense... Micah had a quiet game. He didn't really do anything. Um, I was impressed with Tony Pollard at about 110 yards rushing, and their backup running back didn't do that bad of a job. But it just it was a really odd look. And I just like when I look at the Vikings. Look, Justin Jefferson had another 100 yard game. His 20 of 100 yard game in his first three seasons, which was incredible. Um, and he only needs 88 yards uh, to have the most receiving yards for a wide receiver in their first three years, um, which is incredible. He will. Most he will get the highest paid wide receiver contract 
in NFL history at the moment. I think we will rightfully deserve it. Um, and it's just incredible to see that basically Kirk Cousins and Justin Jefferson has become two and Tyreek or Aaron and Devontae last year, where Kirk Cousins, he doesn't he doesn't really care who's around. He's just going to throw it to Justin Jefferson if he sees him open. He's going to give him chances. And it just it's downright incredible to watch that kind of connection, and it bails Kirk Cousins out in a lot of ways. So, um, And then, you know, look, this is going to be a weird spot too because Kirk Cousins, he got his 11th victory all time against a team that is going to have a winning record at the end of the year. The Bills will have a winning record. Um, Cousins is also 2-8 and eight all time against Dallas. And in these late afternoon spots, it's not 1 o'clock Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins has a winning record in 1 o'clock games. When you get him into prime time, it doesn't, or when you get him in the late afternoon or prime time games, it does not turn out well. And he is seven to fourteen in these late afternoon games, and he is two and eight all time against Dallas. Um, but the last time that Dak played Kirk on Sunday, on in Minnesota against Dallas, he was able to win that one that prime time game against Dallas a couple years ago. Um, you know, like so, so when you look at this game, it, it basically comes down to me. To where I saw the Cowboys choke a massive lead. If they were able to hold that 14-point lead against the Packers. Or even hold the lead against the Packers. I probably would have taken Dallas to win. But I feel like with Minnesota, they had this incredible type of feel to them. They are never out of games. And it's like the inverse of Philadelphia. You tr- People can have more trust in the Vikings because they keep winning these close games. So, you know, to me, I I just... I'm going to trust that again. Like, if they can beat Buffalo with that, I think they'd be, they, they can beat Dallas with that. Could Dallas win? Sure. And if Dallas, you know, gets after Kirk Cousins, if they can limit Justin Jefferson enough, I think, you know, they, they'll win the game. I don't think that happens. And I'm going to trust the Vikings' close situational awareness compared to Dallas's. I'm going to trust Kevin O'Connell and what he's been able to do compared to Mike McCarthy and what he's been able to do with the Cowboys this year. Also, I just think it was crazy you had the Vikings as an underdog. So, to me, uh, it's it's always good if you're going to take picks to take the points with the picks as well. So, that's why I like Minnesota here, plus two, and Minnesota straight up. The next game, the Cincinnati Bengals over the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, uh, this is one to where, look, the Bengals actually avoided the Panthers the last time they were out. They had a 35-0 game at the half. Joe Mixon tied an NFL record with five rushing touchdowns. Um, Joe Burrow played well. And, you know, look, the Steelers, good for them. I have to give T.J. Watt his credit. He comes back in the defense. I mentioned what I said about the Saints. He had four total tackles and... I think two, or two solo tackles in the game, which was incredible. George Pickens scored his second career touchdown on that one-yard rushing TD. Um, I do want to say that Chris Boswell being put on the IR is significant uh, because Matthew Wright, he did okay, but he also missed a kick. I, but I also think, though, when you look at the Bengals, they want revenge because Joe Burrow, since week one with his five-turnover game, um, since then, he has gone 5-3 and three with 15 touchdowns and three total turnovers. Since that game against Pittsburgh in Week 1, which basically derailed his MVP chances from the beginning. Also, Jamar Chase could be back. I think the Bengals are going to be motivated to get this victory against a you know young rookie quarterback only into, into his about 5th to 7th start. Um, I think the Bengals are going to be able to run the ball more effectively. I think uh, the Bengals are going to be motivated. And I just think the Bengals are playing at a higher level and a more consistent level than what I've seen out of the Steelers. And I just think with the Bengals' defense, how rough that offensive line is, I think the Bengals pass rush can get home to Kenny Pickett. And I think the Bengals, you know, pull off a gritty, tough, hard-fought win. Uh, so that's why I like Cincinnati here, minus five, and Cincinnati straight up. And then the final two games, uh, in a weird incident uh, with the uh, Chargers, or with the Chargers, they are in back-to-back primetime games. Uh, the uh, Kansas City Chiefs over the Los Angeles Chargers. Um, I am taking Kansas City here because... Mahomes now has won 24 straight games in November and December. Uh, he is leading the league in passing yards and 25 passing touchdowns. He has 16 four or more passing touchdown days. Um, and he has 176 passing touchdowns in 72 starts. Um, that's the most by any quarterback in their first 75 starts. Um, I want to give Cam Dicker, the former uh, Eagle kicker and former, uh, yeah, former Eagle kicker, uh, he's been perfect so far, and honestly, I would kind of keep him over Dustin Hopkins. And I know Hopkins is coming up from a quad injury, but still. Um, and when you look at Mahomes, he's never lost. He's never lost in Los Angeles in either uh, SoFi Stadium or the soccer stadium that the Chargers played in for the first couple years. But he's never lost a road game to the Chargers. And there's just something about Brandon Staley 
that like you kind of realize in these big moments he is not good in close spots. He's only nine and eight in one score games throughout his career, and it's just one of those things to where again like if you're in these situations, they blew this game last year in an overtime fashion at home in a prime time like last Thursday, you know the Thursday night game. I just I don't have confidence that with the Chargers team as banged up as it is, they lost another defensive starter over the injury uh, last night. I just do not have confidence in this team that they'll be able to hold on and uh, win this game in a, in a tight game. If they get Keenan and Mike back, that'll help. But I think at the end of the day, give me Mahomes, give me Kadarius Tony, which kudos to him. He scored his first touchdown. Um, and give me the Chiefs to keep winning to pretty much seal the division off from everybody else. So That's why I like the Kansas City Chiefs here to win straight up, but the Los Angeles Chargers plus seven. And finally, the San Francisco 49ers over the Arizona Cardinals. This is one to where, look, San Francisco, they played well. They played really well. Um, they Their defense, D'Amico Ryans, who is the number one defense in terms of total yards this year, he has held seven of his nine opponents to under 300 total yards. And I believe, if I heard correctly, the Chargers offense as a whole in the second half only gained 53 yards of total offense. That's insane, even with all the at- talent that the Chargers have lost on the offensive line and, and the skill positions. That's an incredible number for D'Amico Ryans to hang his hat on. Uh, I also want to give Nick Bosa credit. He got another sack, so he is now another 10-plus sack season. And I think it said that Nick and Joey Bosa now are the only third or fourth uh, si- or family or sibling duo to have a combined 100 sacks as a unit. I think the Watts are one, and uh, maybe the Matthews. Um, yeah, yeah, the the, uh, the Matthews, Clay and Bruce. Or Clay and Clay. Clay and Clay. Not Clay and Bruce. Clay and Clay. Um... Also, I'm going to give Robbie Gold. I found this stat on Pro Football Reference. Robbie Gold has now made 17 field goals within 20 yards or fewer since 2000. And only five five kickers have made field goals 20 yards shorter. Again, I, I don't mind that. I, I That's the one thing I'll give Kyle Shanahan credit for. I love that he takes field goals. I love that he takes points when he needs them. <laughs> because it's always good to score on aspects like that. So, And look, the Cardinals, look, they got their second win in only the last 12 chances against the Rams. Uh, Cole McCoy now is 3-0 as a starter, like I mentioned before. DeAndre Hopkins has 36 receptions for 396 yards and two touchdowns uh, so far. And the Niners and Cardinals were trying to become the first NFC West team to win in Mexico. Um, I believe the Rams have had a couple opportunities. They lost both of them. Or the Rams had an opportunity, but they ended up having to play in L.A. because of the, the conditions in Mexico. Um, but yeah, in this game, look, the Cardinals, they had a nice moment. But let's be honest, Matthew Stafford was playing and Cole McCoy was playing. I think the Rams won with Stafford. This time it's Jimmy Garoppolo, who, again... Playing more efficient football. Had another rushing touchdown. Did not have a turnover. Played consistent, smart enough football. And that safety who made the big pick, the uh, Troy Pollen was pro- uh, prodigy. I loved him as a safety. He's great. Um, and I just think, again, the Niners are just going to keep rolling. I just think the Niners are just clearly the more consistent team. They're healthier. They're getting healthy. And I just think the Cardinals don't really have a lot of options if Kyler comes back or not against a uh, very loaded Niners team. So that's like San Francisco here, minus 7.5. And, and San Francisco straight up. So those are my picks for this week. Like, comment, rate, subscribe, all that fun YouTube stuff. Check out the NFL YouTube Prognosticators page so we can see Johnny Bretke, Half Moon's Picks, Bridgewater's Finest. Um, uh, you have uh, Nam's Noodle, The Blind Canadian Cat. Uh, if you like Philadelphia sports, please check out Philly Take of RB. If you're a Philadelphia 76ers fan, check him out. Check out Fire and Brim Sports. And also, for any Raider fans out there, check out the Raider Report from Chat Sport, uh, by Chat Sports. Uh, Mitchell Renz does a great job, and I've also just enjoyed it for all his uh, angry Josh McDaniels rants. <laughs> so check out the Raider Report from Mitchell Renz if you have the chance. Uh, he's a great uh, content creator for Chat Sports and the Raiders themselves. Uh, but that is it. So until next week for Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving weekend, uh, good luck to all players, coaches, teams, fantasy players, and fellow prognosticators. And until next week for my Week 12 predictions, this is Matthew Fanatic signing off. Until next time, everyone, so long.